Hi guys, it is a gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on this cloudy Wednesday, May. I'm sorry, where am I putting, our, putting us in May? It is March 18th, uh, 2020, so I am in the middle of uh, our uh, little mini-series I'm devoting all this entire week to, and that is the Coronavirus Chronicles here on Collapse Chronicles, and I am your host, Sam Mitchell, and I have the great honor of bringing back onto the show uh, <clears throat> Sid Smith. If you miss my full hour-long uh, interview with Sid Smith, Sid calls himself a retired math professor and student of collapse, and this man has been studying the collapse of global industrial civilization. So we are here to talk about the coronavirus and what it means for the global industrial economy and possibly all of civilization. So Sid Smith, come on and say hi to the folks and let's get right into this conversation. Hi, Sam. It's, it's good to be back on. Okay. With that, uh, we're, we're going to dive right into it. So Sid, as I've done with others before you and will be doing with others after you, I have a list of eight questions here, and we're going to start out with the essay question. Number one, just the overall question on everyone's mind down here in the Dumasphere. In your opinion, could the coronavirus be the trigger for the collapse of global industrial civilization and why or why not? Well, I, I wish I could give you a yes or no answer, but actually the, the, the thing is global industrial civilization has been collapsing, uh, and, and it's going to continue to collapse. So uh, what we're seeing here is uh, uh, one of those ratcheting downs, you know, one of, those, one of those big watershed events where people suddenly sit up and take notice uh, of what's been going on and what it means for us. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, uh, uh, the metaphor I used in one of my talks, you know, if you're playing Jenga and you see that tower start to kind of to waggle back and forth a little bit, and you know it's going to fall, and then lo and behold, somebody accidentally bumps the table, right? Yeah. So, so coronavirus bumped the table, and, uh, and so we don't know exactly how big a, a step down this is going to be. But it's going to be a step down uh, that isn't the first one and certainly not the last one, but just a, a probably a pretty sizable one in the middle of what's an ongoing collapse of global industrial civilization. So in and of itself, it, it, it's not, it's not so, I mean, the trigger was pulled uh, year, years ago, according to your reading of history. The trigger has already been pulled, and this is just one more, one more bullet in the chamber uh, taking us down. Is that, would that be a metaphorically correct way of stating your position? Sure, I think so. I mean, uh, global industrial civilization is built on abundant fossil fuel, and, and as soon as that ceased to be uh, uh, available at the at the rate of return it was uh, earlier in the 20th century, uh, the collapse began, and, and it was inevitable for that reason. So th this is just part of the ongoing process. Okay, so where would you place the threat of coronavirus uh on the list of threats against civilization? Uh, is it the top of the list, the bottom of the list, or somewhere just lost in the middle of the jumble of all the things on the list? Well, this virus is gonna, is gonna have a pretty big impact on, on, uh, on how people view themselves and, and, and their own safety. You know, it, one of the best things about this probably is that it's gonna help center and ground people a little bit more in, in actual existing reality rather than the one they make up in their heads. Uh, you know, this happens to humanity on a regular basis. Look back through history, uh, plagues are common. And one of the things it does is to remind us that, that our situation is always precarious. Um, and, and this one is, is, a, is a reminder of that fact. Um, as far as the threats against civilization, like I say, civilization is on the way down anyway. Um, but at the same time, we're going to be building a new one. So I don't see this as being, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's you know, that bumping of the table, it's going to create a, uh, a sort of a big ripple 
effect and, and cause things to drop down pretty quickly for a short time. Um, but in the long term, it's not, it's not a high order term in the equation, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah, so, so you, you, you use the word short term, define short term, short term, uh, six weeks, six months, five years. Well, so best case scenario that I can tell is that this thing, uh, gets on the wane by, by early summer. And by autumn, we're, we're back to uh, a new level of economic activity, which is going to be less than it was before permanently, um, but, but still something that's a world we all pretty much recognize. Worst case scenario is that, is that, and this is a real possibility in my view, we're headed into something very much like the 30s, where the, the depression is kind of permanent um, and, and people are going to have a, a long period of adjustment. Uh, and somewhere, you know, those are the bracketing possibilities, and we're going to be somewhere in there. I don't, I, nobody knows where, of course. Yeah, we're getting ready, getting ready to find out. So, so obviously, well, maybe, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. So, do do you consider the direct threat posed to human health by the virus? or the knock-on effects to the global uh, industrial economy to be the, the bigger threat to civilization from this virus? Yeah, no, the, the, the virus itself is going gonna, is gonna to take a lot of the elderly and a lot of the sick, um, although if we flatten the curve, you know, there will be an opportunity for better treatments to come along and, and eventually, of course, a vaccine. Um, so we'll see how that happens. But... But the, the big story with this virus is how it has pricked the, 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 the bubble of the economy. Um, and so that effect seems to me to be one that is going to be uh, uh, more meaningful in retrospect. And, and how, uh, well, you, you somewhat answer this question, but d- describe how, uh, d- describe meaningful. I, I mean, are we talking... You mentioned 30s level depression. Uh, do you think this is going to be bigger than 2008? Oh yeah, I think it already is. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, Gail Sverberg made a nice point in her most recent blog. You know, it, the, the economy is like an organism. Um, you can't just stop it and restart it. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And and it's being stopped. So when it restarts, it's gonna it's gonna have to rebuild itself, and it's gonna have to rebuild itself with the available energy, um, which is less. And so it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna look like it did in the past. What we don't know is how far down it's gonna go um, before it finally hits a new level of stability. You know, this is, this is exactly what uh, 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 John Michael Greer talks about it in the ratcheting down of this civilization. You know, it's gonna happen in, in steps and this is gonna be a very big step. We're gonna drop down it's probably something a little bit reminiscent of the 30s. The difference is going to be that because the energy that was available then isn't available now, um, there won't be uh, an end to that economic depression. It will just become the new normal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to talk about the reaction to the, to, to the uh, virus. And I'm going to break this down into two areas. So let's start with the quote official reaction or the government reaction uh, particularly with all of this it's not just talk anymore uh, about lockdowns where that's the big question in Austin Texas today are we going to get are we going to be put on lockdown all of the restaurants and bars were shut down uh, yesterday here in Austin so the, the, the response to this by the government, and since we're in the U.S. Uh, mainly talking about that, do you consider the response, so far at least, do you think it is overblown relative to the threat? Do you think it is not strong enough relative to the threat? Or do you think the government for once has gotten something just about right? Um, well, I mean... We've got the national government on the one hand. We've got we've got 50 state governments and and, and countless local governments on the other hand. Um, and the, and the response by the states is all over the map, as you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, some states are really locking down hard. California, most particularly. Some states are much slower to react, such as Florida. 
Um, and uh, uh, I, you know, I think I think that that we want to flatten the curve in order to save lives and and, and reduce the impact upon us because. Um, if, if the curve isn't flattened, then the, the economic impact will be more severe, and of course the impact on people's lives who are made sick will also be more severe. Um, so I hate to I hate to make a pronouncement, you know, is it this, this, or this? Um, but but clearly the government has an obligation to try to do the best it can, um, and some governments, of course, I think take that obligation more seriously than others do. Um, I don't want to say anything about our national government other than to say it's revealing its usual dysfunctionality. So, uh, I'm still not sure the answer to your question. It, it almost sounds like in there that you think government's doing about all they can. You know, I, one of the things I find interesting is that it, I, I interacted a great deal with the state government here in Virginia four years ago because I was in charge of our ballot access for the Green Party. And, you know, once you get to know people who actually work in government, I'm not talking politicians, but, but the people who make things run, um, they tend to be smart, thoughtful, well-meaning people. They make mistakes, but, but generally they're good people. Politicians, of course, are, are politicians. They're, they're all over the map, but generally speaking, they're motivated by self-interest. Um, so... I, do I think government is probably doing what it can? I think so. Probably most people are. Um, there's tons of corruption in government, and the corrupt will be corrupt and, and will not do things for the best reasons. Um, but I don't tend to buy into the idea that government is somehow a, a very large conspiracy to enslave us all. I think that's my experience of people in government just doesn't support that notion. Okay, so this is where I was going in my next question, which I noticed my, more of my guests have declined to e even wade into this question. But I, I think it's interesting for the debate. Uh, but if you, if you just want to say, I've got nothing to say to that, then that, that's certainly uh, your choice. But I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to plow ahead as much trouble as I get into even asking this question. Okay, do you believe that the actual threat, that the level of threat of coronavirus uh, to our health and economy trumps our, I hate to use that word, but it's the, it's the verb that, that's there, trumps our civil rights? Specifically, should our government be given the power to curtail such basic freedoms as our freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, and the pursuit of happiness in order to respond to this level of threat? Or should these decisions be left to individual choice to how we want to protect our own health as individuals? Well, you know, we are... Um we are a, a representative democracy, um, and so we, we, invest, uh, we invest powers in our government, but those powers are derived from our consent. So certainly government has the power to protect us, has the authority, has the duty to protect us when protection is needed. And if that means, you know, asking people to stay off the streets, then that's how it is. Um, but government also has to be held to account um, because they're accountable to us, ultimately. And, uh, and we need to make sure that, that any abuses are, are uh, uh, called out and, and, uh, uh, and accounted for and, and appropriate steps taken to, to redress. Um, but I think, you know, it's the, the idea that somehow we, we all have the right to just do what we want and government can't tell us what to do, well, that's not really true. Um, the government uh, gets its sovereignty from us, but it is real sovereignty and it is real obligations. Um, so if the government says to me, in order to protect uh, this population, we need you to stay home for two weeks uh, and not gather together with other people on the street, I'm going to say, okay. How about two years? Well, that's a, <laughs> that, 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 would, that would take a lot of justification for me. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the real threat is if the information is not flowing, right? Yeah, That's the real sure. threat to our freedom is when we can't know what's going on. Um, but at this point, I don't see government hiding much. Uh, not that we can tell. Okay. But, 
when, when government is hiding things from you and lying from you, that's the point at which you've got to say, okay, you, you've lost your, your, your due authority over me because you're not telling me what's going on. All right. That, uh, well, I do thank you for at least uh, ha- sharing in this debate and not just treating uh, it as, you know, as so many people do. Uh, anyway, we need to move on. So let's move on from the, the government and the official reaction, and let's go to what I think is a, a, a more germane story to Collapse Chronicles. And this is the reaction that at least I am seeing with my own eyes here in the great state of Texas, where we are pretty much on the road to Mad Max here in Austin, Texas in the year 2020. Last I heard, 58 people in a state of 30 million people have been diagnosed with coronavirus. I don't think we've had a death in Texas yet. Yet, the the general reaction by the public, I, I mean, supermarket shelves, I, I mean, not just picked, I mean, stripped bare here in, uh, mm-hmm. in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, I guess you've heard about, uh, especially in Texas, Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina, and states like that, that gun sales are going through the roof. Ammo, so people are arming themselves. They're hoarding food. Uh, they're they're in absolute panic mode. Is what I am seeing right here, where where I am living. Uh, just what, do you consider what is going on in the general public to be a good snapshot of what we can expect to see more of as more and more people understand that we are living in a new world. Yes, I think so, and I think probably civil disorder uh, and, and social disorder are among the, the greatest threats that we face in the medium to long term. Um, with respect to the immediate crisis, people are scared, uh, and there's been a lot of disinformation. Um, you know, that our, our, our highly partisan politics resulted in two very different kinds of messages being distributed. Uh, and, and when you don't get good information, then you have to, you have to fill in the blanks for yourself yeah. and people get scared. Um, and, uh, and then they don't, you know, people who are scared often don't behave very well. Uh, so uh, I think this is, this is part of the course. So you're, you're not, so you're, you're not surprised by this reaction. So where is this? So if this is the, uh, if, if this is the appetizer uh, said to the to the full course collapse coming uh, around the corner. What does that it, it, if this this level of threat, depending on however you want to perceive it, has uh, if this stimulus has resulted in this response? What is going to happen when a pandemic with a death rate of eighty percent uh, hits uh, this country? Uh, what 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 is that going to look like? Well, you know the, the initial panic and the initial fright um, that can't last very long, uh, and, and instead it gives way either to social breakdown or to social solidarity. And perhaps one of the best things about this event is that it's giving people an opportunity to have a little bit of a dry run. Right. Uh, and, and responding to crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, uh, and as, as it subsides, people will have an opportunity to reflect upon how they themselves behaved and how they expected other people to behave. And, and it, maybe that will be a good thing. But uh, but certainly there's a risk that uh, that social disintegration could occur. Um, it, surprisingly, it doesn't seem to occur except briefly. Uh, if you look back in, you know, in the 20th century, there were a lot of places that suffered, you know, horrible, uh, uh, horrible crises. And, and generally speaking, you didn't have people murdering each other in the street. Um, that just is not a that's not a common way for people to react once the initial panic has subsided. And panic can't sustain itself. You know, it's, it's got to turn into something else. OK, well, let's uh, let's hope that you do consider this a drill. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there, there, there's somebody else who I'm trying to, I won't mention any names, who, who is someone down in the Dumasphere who's sending out emails, this is not a drill. 
and I emailed this person back. I said, that's exactly what this is, is a drill. Yeah, um, no, but I it, think that's right. It, yeah, anyway, this is not my, uh, not my platform, it's yours. Okay, uh, obviously, I think we know the answer to this question, uh, Sid, but I'm going to add, I'm just curious to hear your answer. Do you think that bigger threats than the coronavirus uh, are on their way uh, in, the near, in the near future? Uh, well, when you say near future, um, you know, that's a, uh, that's a matter of probabilities. Um, there are certainly FBI, much bigger threats on the horizon. Uh, the warfare is a, is a much bigger threat yeah. um, and, uh, and certainly a, a real possibility. Um, and other diseases could be a greater threat, and they're a real possibility. Um, I think that uh, uh, a movement away, f- uh, a weakening of our democratic institutions and a, and a movement toward more author- authoritarian government uh, is a real possibility. Um, so, yeah, and, and of course, in, 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 the, in the medium to long term here, you know, in, for ranging from a few years to the rest of the century, we have uh, catastrophic uh, climate change and uh, um, the drawdown of the natural and, and biosystem resources that are necessary for human life. So, yeah, much bigger threats on the horizon. But in the near future, that's, that's a tough one. That's a matter of probabilities. Who knows? Yeah, especially if, uh, if another one hits in the very near term before we've come out of this one, while we're, while we're still you know, wobbly on our feet from this one, and then, you know, the one-two punch comes along. But anyway, you just mentioned uh, what, what you just said as a perfect segue into my last question. Do you see any uh, lemonade in all these lemons, particularly for our fellow earthlings and the planet? If you were not a, a human and if this was not all about us, how, how would do you think other species on the on this planet be reporting on the coronavirus uh, wreaking all of this if not outright uh, health hazards to humans then then knocking uh, the global industrial economy for such a bl- blow is this good news or bad news for our fellow worthlings well you know I suppose that if they if they were capable of it they'd be feeling a little schadenfreude you know they'll, uh, they're finally getting what they've been deserving um, you know those nasty hominids uh, but I think I think there's tons of lemonade flowing in, in lots of different ways uh, to begin with we needed a drop down in economic activity as you know I'm, I'm the one who's always saying we need collapse to occur and we need it to occur quickly um, and so this is in that sense this is very very good this is slowing down our economic activity uh, it's doing it a little bit abruptly, but we needed to slow it down, and it's never coming back to the level it was before. Uh, so this is good. We're going to end up in a place where the, the the rate at which we're burning up the planet and burning fossil fuels and, and, and destroying things is going to be slowed, and that's a very good thing. Um, I also think that we're going to get a lot of very interesting information out of this. For example, we're going to finally get some hard data about the aerosol masking effect because – with the, the sudden cessation of economic activity, the air is clearing. And we're going to find out what effect that's going to have on temperature and a lot of other things. Um, so that's very good news. I think that... Well, we uh, hope that's good. I well, mean, it's good news we're getting the data, but, but, you know, this is one of the most common. Now, I interviewed, you know, atmospheric physicist Tim Garrett y- uh-huh. yesterday. He completely poo-poos the theory of global dimming. Uh, c- completely it, it brushed off the notion that the coronavirus is, e- even though he admits it's clearing up the skies, he says absolutely no, no effect on global temperatures. Are you as ready to share his view on that as, as he is? No, because we don't have the data. That's, what's, that's the lemonade is that we're going to get the data, and then we'll find out. <laughs> and that's a, that's a very good thing. We don't have to theorize that. Yeah, uh, we'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, we'll, we'll get the lemonade, but we'll see yeah. if it's the biggest lemon and, of them all. <laughs> and I just want to fit in here that, that, from my point of view at least, one of the best things is, you know, as we talked about in my previous uh, interview with you, 
as, as collapse unfolds, people tend to silo themselves into their own little realities, you know, yeah. um, that's part of the broader partisanship. And, and one thing about a crisis is it shatters a lot of those false narratives and forces people to, to address what's real. Uh, and, and that tends to have a good effect on social solidarity. It has, tends to have a good effect on people's personal sanity uh, to suddenly be grappling with the real world rather than living in this made up narrative about, you know, uh, there's a thousand different ones about why things are the way they are. Uh, instead, you actually have to deal with what's present and real and, and actual real neighbors and real shopkeepers. And, you know, it's a dose of reality and a dose of reality is very good for people and it's very good for society. So I think that's a very good thing. Okay, so we do we we do have some sort of silver lining uh, in in this cloud. I say I I would agree with every word you said. I just wish it had held off until I had sold my house. <laughs> I, 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 the, 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 the day I, I I get the the check from this uh, house on a floodplain in Texas. And have uh, gotten myself to my little farm in upstate New York and sheltered in place up there for the uh -huh. summer. I would uh, I, I would agree uh, and with everything you said about the the, the lemonade flowing. But uh, I have one I have one big lemon in my own life. But we all have uh, these realities to face. Uh, it we is do. a reality check. Anyway, Sid Smith, it, it was it was fun. Uh, stick around for a minute after we hang up. But guys, sure. uh, if you enjoyed what Sid had to say, please spend a few seconds thumbing up this video and subscribe to Collapse Chronicles while you're over here. And there will be another dozen or so of these interviews coming up. And hopefully we'll get Sid back in the future for a full interview. But Sid Smith, we appreciate it and keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. It's good to talk to you. Bye, guys.